you guys. <laughs> I mean, you got... really fun to talk to. Dude, I'm people. sure. Yeah, of yeah, course yeah. he is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but let's talk about Lab. Let's mm-hmm. talk about where it came from mm-hmm. and what you hope to achieve with it. Mm, yeah. Um, I What I hope to achieve with Lab was Lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and I don't have any... Um, I guess I had... Maybe that's disingenuous. Um, it's stated in the magazine, kind of, you know. I uh, wanted to uh, show how I how I want the work to be looked at a little bit or how I want the work to be approached, like some of the uh, critical frameworks, of, you know, trying to build some critical frameworks around looking at comics and, like, pop culture aesthetics, you know. Um, and in a way for us to understand better the world that produces them, you know, mm-hmm. and what, what the aesthetics are saying either explicitly, intentionally, or unintentionally about the world, you know, that's producing them. And, um, you know, that's what I guess the intention of Lab was, and the first issue deals a lot with um, my particular identity position, you know, or, you know, blackness explicitly, you know what I mean? But I wanted it to acknowledge sort of the first editor, like the, the, the creator of the magazine, um, to acknowledge my sort of subjective position, the first issue, or issue number zero, before I even go out there to just be honest with the reader about it. You know? mm-hmm. uh, do you think that, I mean, you're so, are you putting forth an aesthetic manifesto in a I put a manifesto in there, kind of cheeky though, you know what I mean, like I hope people get my sense of humor, but yeah, there's a manifesto in the front, um, an aesthetic manifesto I think wouldn't make too much um, sense because like where I'm at, like I kind of think of aesthetics as being like uh, products of sort of like the material world, so like I don't really think, I mean, to, you know, I, I don't I'm struggling with it. But yeah, no, it's not a a manifesto about the production of aesthetics, but more maybe a manifesto about the the critical framework in which we kind of like analyze or, you know, talk about aesthetics. The aesthetic culture at large and how it relates to, you know, uh, because like black culture, like to even analyze that, it's like you're so... Black culture can only be, you can only understand black culture uh, through the lens of something that reduces all these different types of cultures and variations of cultures uh, to a, um, identifying them by, like, a, through a racial, racist framework. Right. You know, because there is no, you know. Because it's automatically monolithic, right, just yeah, to yeah, say yeah. black culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so it's like, either you're talking, like, how I see it, right, this is how I see it right now, is like, if you're talking about black culture, you're either talking about sort of, yeah, um, how, like that reductive lens, or like the, you know, you know the white supremacist uh, grouping of all of these different, you know, variations of culture uh, under a sort of racist, you know, in a, in a racist bracket, or you're talking about the resistance to that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think you could definitely talk about political you know, like you say black culture, well then what is black culture if it's not that? Then it's like, it's definitely resistant to it. And like you have, you know, the historical examples of that, like black power movement and so on and so forth. And that's kind of like how I would, you know, how I would see it. Uh, I've always been, since I was a little kid and looking at the encyclopedias my great grandmother had in a basement of like classical sculpture, um, sort of the reduction of the figure to these shapes, but also like sort of the graphic, uh, yeah, graphic reduction and, you know, sort of like a sim- symbolizing the human figure. And I loved all that, like red red and black figure uh, um, on like classic vases and whatnot, Greek stuff, um, sort of that relationship between like um, how the Egyptians would represent the human figure and you know the Greeks and like sort of that transition from those two ways of uh, of the symbol becoming like more representative and like that tension between those two things has always been something I'm really into that's why like I was really into some of the 
secession stuff, you know, like um, the Austrian artists, like, you know, when I was a kid in school too, like a lot of kids were really getting big on Klimt and Sheila at the time. So like this sort of, you know, um, yeah, like expressive, uh, uh, flattening and mm -hmm. deconstruction of the forms of the human body mm -hmm. but like not so far that we've completely divorced ourselves from like um representing the human figure like that's always been a part of like what i'm really into and i think the floating world stuff speaks to that too because like um from first when i really first started to get into hokusai and like looking at his manga and looking at how he took all of these different you know uh you know, like plants and animals and like the human figures and he breaks it down to a symbol, a symbolic aesthetic regime that he uses and that's his language. And like there's a tension between uh, the line as uh, an expressive form and the representation of something as a um, as a symbol for something else. You know what I mean? So like, you know, the mark is uh, expressing something, right? And it's, that is not, um, that is not an illusion. So like you'll see these marks on clothing and the strokes are giving an energy that you understand is something having to do directly with like the, you know, the energy of how the, the mark maker put it down. While also giving a symbolic representation of say like fur or like muscles or hair you know um and that is, is something that i've always been interested in and like something that i'm still struggling to sort of uh find like what is my sort of aesthetic you know, you know how what is my language for that sort of thing where do i sit in that continuum between like symbol and uh representation you know uh you know like the ultimate being just like you say the ultimate being like the word fish and on the other end like a a literal fish in a pond that you're looking at you know what i mean <laughs> and finding something in between those two things so like that's why i guess all of that is very important to me and like i don't think you could um overestimate the influence that Ian flux had on me when i was a kid peter chung you know um that had a you know and that, I, at that point, I had already come in contact with some of the, you know, classical uh, approach to drawing, which is also a, um, you know, like those 12 figure, you know, like the figures that are like 10 heads tall, 12 heads tall, you know, like yeah. this sort of thing. I'd already come in contact with it. So when I saw it moving in um, Eon Flux, like I was just riveted. And I want to, yeah, I want to give the impression of... Uh, the movement it's funny because in the black arts movement you have examples of those elongated uh figures i'm i'm not sure if there's some sort of uh aesthetic lineage that i have that i'm not that i'm not i mean i'm, I'm aware of it in other Right, uh, but it's like American unconscious artists. in yeah, your own work. Unconsciously, yeah. Part of my oh, life. you know, now that you yeah. mention it, yes, of course. Yeah. Like the um, you know, like the beginning of Good Times. Yeah, yeah, like, I, yeah. That, that painting's there. amazing. Yeah, yeah, but like also, there's a lot of artists that do things like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm blanking on a lot of them right now, but yeah, there is an aesthetic tradition in like the Harlem Renaissance. What is that guy's name? Amazing painter. I want to say. Um, hold on. But uh, yeah, also that use of color, that guy is like pretty amazing too. I had a, a homegirl, you know, who she would see my work. And she's from Japan and she would say, well, uh, your work has a Shibui quality. Mm -hmm. right? And I was like, ah, oh, Shibui. So I started to look into it and trying to understand like what it was and like, what does that mean? Like, what does this aesthetic principle mean, you know? And then I was like, okay, yeah, word. My work does have that 
quality. And in Prince of Cats, when I started to do the color work, um, I, I started to realize like there is an element of shibusa to um, like graffiti, mm -hmm. like, um, the the occasional bright, the um, and I mean graffiti not as a piece but as like a phenomenon on a wall, mm -hmm. you know, like found. You know yes. what I mean? So like you have old pieces, new pieces, throwies, like whatever the fuck up on the wall, and like dust and grime. And like that dust and grime mixed with the occasional shock of pink or like that blue, you know, it has like a Shibusa, a Shibui quality, right? And so that aesthetic principle certainly uh, reflected and, you know, is reflected in my work. And I started to look at it, not to try to recreate myself, but to see like, to have an understanding of what it is that's really getting me off when I'm using or choosing the colors that I do. I've blown up to a three foot by three foot image your uh, polystyrene, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which has a, I mean, I'm going to call it a teal, but you mm. might want to correct me, but has oh, this that's... great, like, vibrant, bang on piece mm. of teal, like, coming out of it. And you use that a lot. And you do that with pink, too, mm. a lot. Yeah. And I remember you telling me that when you were first doing Prince of Cats at Vertigo, uh, there was a hesitance mm. to pink. Uh, not <laughs> on that, my part. Yeah, yeah. Right, no, no, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> on the publisher's part. Yeah. And that you sort of had to go to battle for yeah, yeah, your yeah. use of pink. Yeah, an editor said it, the cover looked a little fey, I think. They said. <laughs> it's like a really, you know, antique <laughs> way of, you know. Yeah, I was like, wow, okay. Man, when I was coming up, when I was thinking about color, like I was, you know, I was just in the posters, you know what I mean? The posters just always got me, and like um, sort of the 60s, uh, radical theater, Japanese radical theater posters. Also, like the use of, I guess, processed colors and like sort of like that yes. super raw, mixed, you know, colors just boom, like uninterrupted. Like I always, I always loved that. And the pink, I think the pink also, there's something about it being like, for when I first started to use it in the magenta, there being something about like, it's something transgressive about using it, especially as like a, as a like a male body, you know, like kind of masculine type of dude. It's like, you know, just being like, okay, no, like this is, like this is cool. This is um, this is what it is. Like you know, the color doesn't have a sort of gender, and if it does, so what too? You know what the I mean? very like, fact that you got pushback means it yeah, was yeah, it yeah, was yeah, like yeah, a yeah. radical choice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> Which is ill, because it's like, it was dope, right? It was yeah, hot. Like, it it looks beautiful. Good, you know, so it's like, it's funny. Um, and it's just, I think for me, it had less to do with any sort of saying anything explicitly about it. But kind of like when you come in contact with something like that, that makes you feel some type of way, it, it makes, it can either, either you're just going to get lost in your feelings or you're going to become more like aware of subjectivity. You know what I mean? You're going to be aware of like, oh, this color got me feeling tight. Why though? You know what I mean? Like yeah. historically, why? Like, you know, culturally, why does a color make me feel some type of way? You know what I mean? I'm sitting here looking at a, a you know, a macho image, but like the pink got me feeling some type of way about myself. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, I see, yeah, people are, people are really weird. I think it's really interesting that people even have, they feel like they say it and they don't realize what they're saying. You know, even about themselves, they're like <laughs> they felt like, wow, you're really gonna broach this topic like this. You know, it's kind of like with the um, lighten up thing, where it's like, you know, you get the message, and it's like, oh, could you lighten the skin of this character? Uh -huh. And it's like, you know, it also, you know, like uh, depend, it's rel, it's relative to the world that we live in, why it means something, right? Um, and the fact that it's something that people are even thinking to address. Speak is it like it speaks to something else and something larger, which is not necessarily intentional, which is not necessarily yeah like uh, you know uh, intentionally sinister or whatever. It's just like it, it's indic like it's indicative of what the world. Is. It's not that always going to be about intent. Does intent really matter? What was your take on this cartoon? Um. <clears throat> Yeah, well, when I saw this cartoon, uh, I'm, 
I mostly was just astonished by how poorly made it was. Like, it's not a, it's not a great example of the craft, you know. Um, the writing is a little, it's a little weak. <laughs> and in the, um, the cartooning, there's no likeness involved, you know. And, you know, it's racist. It's so, lazy. Let me ask you this, and I mean, how would you have done this cartoon let's say you were the cartoonist and you wanted to criticize serena for this you know quote unquote tantrum uh, some people agree that she did behave pretty badly on the court with poor sportsmanship so how would you have drawn this cartoon differently to draw attention to this kind of behavior mm, well i mean it i probably wouldn't have had the same opinion so i wouldn't have drawn that cartoon but if i had to depict uh serena williams I probably would have went for a likeness, something where you can actually tell what the uh, athlete looks like from looking at the drawing. Um, and not necessarily relying on uh, racist shorthand for laughs. Uh, do, do you think there's, there's ignorance? The whole shit is so tired, man. Like, yeah. So tired. <laughs> you know, it's like, and to have to, have to do it, it's like, um, it's like, well, I guess it's my turn. I want to get better at talking about the things in a way that, like, that I can simplify it. Like the the fact of the matter is, is like, it's just part of the work. And I don't know if there is a place where um, this won't this won't be part of the work. You know, like it, it's not. You know, there's this work. There's like real life, like living in a way that upends this the 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 world that creates the need for this work you know but it's my turn you know what I mean and like I think to be like oh I don't have to talk about this or like it's not my job to talk about this it's like well if I can you know I mean it's one of two things right you know and who knows where we are in this regard it's like uh, when you can't talk to people anymore it's like it's really just about expression like an expression a direct expression of changing the power relations you know mm -hmm. I mean? and that has to do with violence yeah so um you know i'll talk for as long as i can <laughs> <laughs> you know um intent doesn't matter like part of the job as a cartoonist is to be aware of the history mm -hmm. of aesthetics to um draw from uh, the public's awareness of certain aesthetics and be knowledgeable about those aesthetics to create a uh, an impactful image and um, you know in this case it, it's not the cartoonist doesn't demonstrate uh, an expertise at the job you know a knowledge of how aesthetics work globally you know like Australia is part of the same Western network that um, uh, put forth a lot of um, colonial aesthetics racist aesthetics so uh, wherever he is, like I, you know, I, I don't really see there being an excuse for yeah. uh, that cartoon. Uh, these become such a mess. It's crazy, and they wilt like that. Imagine if Sheila, when he did his like, you know, sunflowers, he did something with these motherfuckers, you know. I think comics are in a great place because there's more happening with comics at SP. First of all, if we're going to take our sort of market, right, as like the literal market, as like um, an indication of where comics are. Like right? when I'm at New York Comic Con, it's not really about comics, right? It's about uh, selling fan art, aesthetic, you know, like the sort of byproduct of whatever sort of like big consumer product, like you know, big two, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's not really comics. When I'm at SBX, okay, it's about comics, right? Um, and the community that's there is way, like it is aspirational in terms of uh, sustainable, um, gentle and loving uh, relationships between people and like the community. I wish I had a list of other cartoonists 
that if someone came looking, checking for me, they could just check for all of these other cartoonists, like, you know, Chris Kindred, uh, Richie Pope, Ben Passmore, Tana, I want to say, I can't remember her last name, people. This other Cat Lawrence that I met, too, it was dope, like Cat's Mountain, Oakland, John Jennings, you know, uh, you know, Nicole Hamilton, like all of the squad, man, like people who are doing great stuff that I want people to see and get amped for. Like the new people who are coming up that got me really excited about comics, you know, as a community, as well as like, you know, the production of that community, you know, like the various things that they're making. Um, I'm really excited about it. And I'm actually chilling. Like I come out and I say something every once in a while. I'm like, you know, almost like don't even check for me until like, the end of 2019 2020 then i'll come out again but like now i want them like let them shine let them do what the town of tucker maybe let them shine let them do what they do and you know um i'm gonna take you know what i mean like i'm gonna tag out i'm gonna let them come in and like you know they can they can fight andre the giant for a couple rounds <laughs> you know what i mean like and i'm just gonna go off and like catch my breath and like watch them perform and do wonderfully and lovely and win all the awards and like get in all the Twitter beef, you know what I mean? And then like come the end of 2019, like 2020, like boom, I come out again, like <laughs> smash, pow, chair off the top rope, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like what's on my mind right now. Like I'm really just out here. I'm going to Columbus, Ohio um, at the end of the week. Only reason I'm going is to meet and hang out with the kids I met while I was out there, like the artists I met while I was out there, like that's it. That's where my head is right now. Um, I'm just trying to like, I'm trying to produce the work, but also like be uh, a good member of the cartoonist society, man. Which like I'm, while I was while I was sleeping, I feel like it just sprouted up and like it's in a really great place. Like I'm coming off. This is the SPX high. You're hearing about why you need to be at SPX next year. If only, you know, not as a professional, if only to talk to the people that are there, man. Like, I think it's going to blow your mind, honestly. It's I'd best, rather be there as the a fan. It's the best convention, man. Like, it's the best. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, sure, man. I love you, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>